Good afternoon and thank you for joining us. On behalf of the Center for International Development and the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies at Harvard, I'm delighted to welcome you to the webinar we're hosting today on challenges to contain COVID-19 in Latin America, lessons from Ch Peru uh, and Chile. I'm Gordon Hansen, Peter Wertheim Professor in Urban Policy at Harvard Kennedy School, and I'll be moderating today's event. We very much uh, appreciate you being with us to discuss this timely and important topic. I think we're Many of us are aware of how coronavirus cases have risen sharply in Latin America. And although there are signs now that the number of new cases is beginning to drop in some countries, the region uh, remains the epicenter of the pandemic uh, and the worst hit in the world. Large informal sectors, densely packed urban areas, and now overburdened health systems have been combined to help uh, the virus spread. Uh, and Chile and Peru are, are emblematic of the challenges that Latin America has faced. With only 8% of the world's population, Latin America accounts for over one third of global deaths uh, from COVID-19. And in that ranking, Peru is number two and Chile number eight in per capita deaths from uh, the pandemic. The reactions of governments to the region, uh, the reactions of governments in the region to the pandemic have shown a tremendous heterogeneity uh, and variation in effectiveness. And we'll be exploring those differences in our discussion today. We're delighted to have with us uh, Maria Antonetta Alva, who is the Minister of Economy and Finance of Peru, and also an alumna of Harvard Kennedy School, and Eduardo Engel, who's Professor of Economics at the University of Chile and a leading public intellectual in the region on the effective design of economic policy. So the ground rules for today is we'll uh, have each uh, presenter talk for a, uninterrupted for about 12 or 14 minutes, and then have a, a, a brief exchange among the three of us before opening it up to, to Q&A with, uh, with the audience. And I encourage you to submit your questions directly to the chat uh, and we'll then relay these uh, questions uh, to the speakers. So we'll begin uh, with uh, Minister Alba from Peru. Maria Antoinetta Alba Luperdi is Peruvian public administrator and has been Minister of Economy and Finance since October, 2019. She has also held other positions in the Ministry of Economy and Finance and in the Ministry of Ed Education in Peru. She completed her undergraduate studies in economics at the Univer Universidad del Pacifico and completed her master's in public administration and international development at the John F. Kennedy School of Government here uh, at Harvard. Minister Alba has been leading efforts by the Peruvian government to contain the economic and social impacts uh, of COVID-19. Minister Alba, it's our pleasure to have you with us today, and I turn the microphone over to you. Uh, hi, good morning with everybody. I would like to, well, thank you for this invitation. I would like to do like a brief presentation about uh, the challenge for the Peruvian economy. It will be really quick. I'll try to do it really quick. Well, so as you know, um, the world is facing one of the worst crises in human history with regrettable consequences for human lives and with high economic costs. In this context, Peru a timely implemented one of the strictest policies in terms of mobility in the world. This is, you can see this Oxford University index to gain valuable time to increase the attention and response of our health system and protect the Peruvian. This is some data about how uh, really weak was our health system. Besides the health measures by the government, uh, help it to moderate the spread of the pandemic. It's important to highlight that Peru's began the battle against COVID-19 with macroeconomic strength, but also with important weaknesses in microeconomic aspects. With respect to macroeconomic strength, the Peruvian economy is one of the strongest and resilient economies in Latin America. We have a long track record of continuous growth and a successful fiscal and monetary policies for more than 20 years. Responsible fiscal management has allowed the construction of important fiscal space and the history of solvency and fiscal prudence is reflected in the lowest levels of fiscal deficit and public debt in the region and are, are an important asset for the crisis. However, uh, the COVID-19 has highlighted our weaknesses as a society. For example, our country has a high level of informality, less penetration in the financial system and deficient public services. 
which limited to some extent the effectiveness of public policies implemented during the crisis. Peru, a macroeconomic strength has been essential in supporting measures to face the COVID-19. Therefore, to face the pandemic challenges, the Peruvian government promptly implemented an economic plan that uses all available economic policy instruments to minimize the pandemic impact on the population. The plan is one of the most ambitious that Peru has ever adopted and reached 20% of GDP. In particular, it includes tax and public spending measures, as well as the provision of liquidity through pension accounts, guaranteed loans, among others. In addition, the instruments were used to support the two phases of our plan, the pandemic control phase and the economy reactivation phase to return to the potential growth path in the shortest possible term. In general, the government has focused assistance on vulnerable families through subsidies. To provide a support to families, we have focused on the most vulnerable households to receive subsidies. Also tax relief and liquidity measures have been approved. Family subsidies have covered more than 8 million households representing 60% of households in Peru. The opportune delivery of this subsidy has been a great challenge due to the structural problems facing the Peruvian economy, such as high informality, low penetration of the banking systems. For instance, in Peru, only four out of 10 adults have a bank account. In addition, to avoid the negative effects of the pandemic lasting over time, programs were created to support companies, especially SMEs, among which Reactiva Peru and FAE program stand out. These are aimed at guaranteeing the continuity of the payment, the payment chain and provide the necessary conditions for the reactivation of companies in general. These programs, as we see in this, in this slide, have been effective in guaranteeing the credit flow in the economy. Uh, additionally, in, in work in coordination with the Congress, we have implemented a new state guarantee program to support good payers in the financial system whose capacity to pay was affected by the pandemic. These guarantees will be for consumer mortgage and SME loans and will benefit more than 3 million people. Furthermore, the resumption of economic activities is taking place. Uh, the, the opening of the economy started in the phase one in May. This was uh, followed by phase two and three. And now we are in phase, in phase four. Uh, in this phase, economy is operating at 98%. As you can see, um, this reopening of the economy has allowed a, low, a, low pro, a, a rapid process, a relatively rapid process of economic activity recovery. A GDP re registered uh, the highest fall in April. This is consequence of this, as I mentioned at the beginning, this very strict lockdown of the economy. And in August, our last number is we have reached uh, the lowest contraction since the pandemic began. And uh, in the coming months, we expect that the economy recover, that the economy will recover uh, and show a better performance in the second half of the year. Uh, as we see, uh, we expect that this, from this crisis, Peruvian economy will recover quickly. Uh, we will gain or we will return to pre-COVID levels uh, despite the severity of the crisis. And this will be uh, faster than as we have seen in comparison to other crises. And in addition uh, to this important signs of economic recovery, this has been also an improve in the uh, indicators reflect the pandemic side situation. Uh, for example, we see uh, a moderation in the reproduction number, the R value, when we um, started this, this um, lockdown of the economy, our R value was three, and now we are uh, less than 1%. We consider that we are in the control phase. Um, and what we see for the next years, we see that uh, the Peruvian economy will go from register at 12% of drop in 2020, to a 10% growth in 19 in 2021. It will be the highest rate support uh, since 1994, supported by the economic measures implemented and the return to normality of the production services. Uh, in this scenario, that we will continue with the construction projects, reactivation of household consumption. This will also support the economic rever uh, recovery. Uh, and of course, we, we expect that we will uh, Start, we will be at the pre-COVID levels in 2022. 
So um, I think that the great lessons of this crisis is that macroeconomic aspects matters, but the uh, microeconomics too. And because of our this macroeconomic um, strength allow us to implement this uh, huge plan, but also the microeconomic uh, um, weaknesses affected the implementation of, of the plan. But our last uh, message is that we see that the economy is already recovering. We are in a political um, situation. We have already, uh, we will have elections on April of next year. So we are, um, since the Minister of Finance, uh, we have a, a big compromise with the reco recovery of the economy. So the next government will will find an economy that is recovering and, and will have a, a big agenda of fiscal consolidation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Alva. The uh, the experience that Peru has had is just simply extraordinary, both in terms of the rapidity with which the virus took hold and the dramatic efforts uh, to combat it. Um, the economic decline that the country has seen is, is, is one of the more severe, but it's encouraging to see signs of recovery um, and our hopes that, that uh, the country is able to turn the corners planned in, in 2021. We'll now turn our attention to, to Chile uh, and welcome uh, Professor Eduardo Engel, who is a, a faculty member in the Department of Economics at the, the Universidad de Chile. He's former president and current board member of the think tank uh, Espacio Público, and he's had a long and distinguished academic career, beginning with, beginning with his first faculty appointment uh, at Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, a brief return to Chile was followed uh, by then more than a decade on the faculty of Yale's economic department, and Eduardo has been back in Chile since uh, 2012. Uh, he's not just devoted himself to academic efforts, but also in terms of translating academic insights into the public sphere. Most notably, he chaired the Presidential Advisory um, Council on Conflicts of Interest, Influence, Peddling, and Corruption, known as the Engel Commission in 2015. Eduardo, thank you much uh, for, for being with us today, and I turn the microphone over to you. Thanks a lot, Gordon, for this invitation. It's a pleasure to to be here and let me just get this started. Here we are and we go. Okay, you, you see that well, I hope? I assume that was a yes. Um, so let's start in March when the first signs of COVID were coming from China late, late February, in fact, what would you have expected for Chile? And I think it was fair to say that expectations were high. Chile has had good health indicators for a long time. Life expectancy in Chile is above 80 years. To give one example, number 36 worldwide among more than 200 countries. In Latin America, only number two to Costa Rica. Um, governance indicators, which are again are gonna be crucial when you have these major challenges for the entire state and society are also and have always been good for Chile. Look at one of them, control of corruption with the world governance indicators. Um, and Chile is more than one standard deviation above the world average, number 39 worldwide out of again, more than 200 countries. And again, number two, Latin America only um, below Uruguay. And a long story of successful health outcomes. Um, so Chile was an early, poor country at the time in the 60s, dealing successfully, for example, with child malnutrition. Uh, that was one early example of policies which went, did not change with very different governance in the 50s, 60s and 70s. There's the story of Chile's um, health indicators together with Cuba being the only ones in the late 60s which were way above what was suggested by their GDP per capita. You look at what happened with COVID-19 and in a, on one slide, it's a big disappointment. So death per million, Chile is number eight worldwide um, after Peru, Bolivia, and Brazil, and Latin America. But even the US, that's a bit better than Chile, not much, it's number 10. When it comes to cases per million, Chile is number 11 worldwide. Again, in Latin America, only Panama and Peru are doing worse. Um, and if you look sort of at the ability to test, now you, you don't want to only test, but you, the, the right measure is how many tests you have um, per each case. You need to have tests relative to how much cases you have in a country. 
And there's this recent study looking at the situation in August, the COVID commission, the land from the Lancet magazine, and Chile is number 62 out of 84 countries. So despite the fact that Chile was early in preparing to test a lot, and it's a nice story of um, a public-private partnership with government, universities, private sector. In March, Chile was the leading country in the number of tests per million in Latin America, and it still is up there, number one and number two. But compared to the number of cases we had, it was far from enough. And that's why when you look at indicators used for testing, which is your ability to test compared to your cases, again, Chile did not perform well. This is a graph of the most sophisticated measure. There's problems with measurement. Chile does measure its data better than most of other Latin American countries. You need some correction there. But even after you correct, Chile is, um, had a disappointing, disappointing um, performance in terms of handling the, the pandemic. What went wrong? First, wrong strategy. Um, the government correctly strengthened hospital ability. You could put patients in the public and private system without any problem. Um, it got a lot of ventilators and the like, so that part worked relatively well. Um, did very little to build up tracing ability, almost nothing at all. They decided to give up on tracing for the first few months, which was a major mistake. Chose The government chose a very risky strategy of dynamic lockdown. So the city of Santiago with seven to eight million inhabitants um, is a very interconnected city and it would close down one borough and have another borough not closed down at the same time. And it assumed that the data it had on the number of cases on a daily basis in every of the boroughs of Santiago was precise and it was really far from precise and the entire scientific community doubted this strategy. The government persisted. Um, it did not listen to scientific evidence. It did not listen to the scientific committee it convened. So this was a case of hubris, um, of excess confidence. Um, and the reason for this, in my opinion, is that it was a highly partisan approach. So the government was with very low approval ratings because of a social outburst, which began in October of last year, and saw COVID-19 as its opportunity to recuperate its initiative and approvals. So it took a strategy which was highly politicized, which meant if things went right, it would be um, a major success for the government. But if things were wrong, went wrong, they would be entirely to blame. And unfortunately, the latter is clo much closer to, to what, what happened. Um, there was also major controversies regarding data. This has been common in many countries, but in Chile it was possibly one of the main causes why the Minister of Health in charge of the first wave of the pandemic, so from, from the beginning in late February, all the way through mid-June when he was forced to resign, um, had to resign. Basically, it turns out that the numbers on the people dying from COVID had been underreported systematically and sort of the final stroke which led to his resignation was when it became public in mid-June that the numbers being reported by the Chilean government to the World Health Organization were much larger than numbers being reported in the daily press conferences in Chile. Um, there was poor risk communication. The government, and this is also no worldwide, um, was in a big hurry to get back into the economics and the economic recovery, not realizing that with the pandemic out of control, that just doesn't work. So in late April, you had this Kafkian um, discussion on TV between the health minister and his undersecretary on whether he should go have a beer or have coffee. And of course, the right thing was to stay at home at the time because the number of cases was increasing. And with that poor communication, people got the wrong message and in fact went to have beers and coffees. And then in early May, we had a total outburst. Chile has had the largest number of cases per capita in a week, I think, in a world pandemic worldwide, or number one, number two in that. So this got really, really totally out of control. And then we say that it turned into the high number of deaths. Um, there was very little about asking the people to take care of themselves, very afraid of having strong communication campaigns. Um, and very, then um, very slow supporting the health policies with economic measures. Um, it had to be Chile's medical association, which had to convene six leading economists, quite diverse, um, to start thinking about the um, fiscal stimulus 
Then the government took it, but the government was not the one to do it first. I mean, it took a long time so to, to get the money to people. And of course, you cannot ask people to stay at home if they do not have resources to stay at home. Chile does not have the formality problem that Peru has. So Chile people are not the lack of access to banking. Every Chilean with his ID, which you have an ID system for the entire country, has an automatic bank account with Banco Estado. So you could have put money into their pockets in a week. But the government was slow in the politics of realizing this was urgent, and then slow in passing to Congress. And then, because they wanted to turn this into political convenience and having government officials show up on a photograph giving boxes with food to people instead of just putting money into the bank accounts, it was slow in getting the goods and, and resources to, to the people. Um, so this, this means you lost, you lost precious time. And then we found out a week ago that you didn't target that well anyway. So 500,000 people um, received the subsidy which were not entitled to this uh, special family income. And now we have that they are going to be taken to court, especially those who are in the public servants where legally this is illegal, it's a serious misdemeanor. So it didn't help. And then, but I will, I will argue though, when we get to later that this is not the main explanation. We have, of course, many inequality in Chile. What you see in this graph is on the horizontal axis is a multidimensional index of poverty, the index used by the Chilean government for Santiago boroughs, and it goes all the way from close to 0% in the rich part of Santiago, which is Vitacura, Las Condes, Providencia, Ñoa, La Reina, um, and all the way to 30, 40%. So this is a lot of heterogeneity. And what we have in the vertical axis is by how much did deaths registered by the official institution which does this and which is beyond political debate um, increase if you look at this year compared to last year, all the way through September, I think. Um, and of course, it increased everywhere. Realize that by having this relative measure, you are correcting for the fact that in poorer neighborhoods, people overall die more. So this is included in this measure. It's, it's beyond that. And still, you have that in the rich neighborhoods, which, by the way, have much more older people in general, which are much more susceptible to COVID, um, deaths increased by 20% on average while in the poorer neighborhoods, it's by 60%. So this is uh, one of many manifestations of the fact that inequality is an important element. Here's uh, the part of the fiscal stimulus. Um, this is comparable figures. When you look at all these numbers on fiscal stimulus, be careful because governments often tell you numbers about which they never really end up spending at all. It's just money that's there in principle. For example, if you ask people to pay taxes six months later, the amount of government resources involved is relatively minor. But these are numbers from the IMF, which I hope correct for these things and make them comparable. And Chile is high there. It's number um, four in Latin America. Okay, but the major issue is it came late. And of course, that was crucial for the first wave of the pandemic. A second opportunity in mid-June, we have a change of the health minister. We have a new minister with a significant change in tone and style, not aggressive and, and the like, so major improvement there. Some lessons learned by, this, by the new minister compared to his predecessor. Um, there's the development of a tracing system. Still could be much better in my opinion, but uh, I'm most honest opinion, and improvements in community risk, but again, it's much better because the starting point is not that great, um, but still a lot to go in my opinion. And yet some caveats, um, they began easing restrictions earlier than most experts suggested. Okay, in fact, there was no expert suggesting to start that fast. Um, and so far, relatively it's gone well. So there's been major increases in some regions of Chile, especially the extreme south and um, near to Patagonia and um, Magallanes it's called, and you have um, the highest cases per capita in the pandemic in Chile so far. Um, but in the metropolitan region of Santiago, which is close to half the population of Chile, it's still going down. So it's been successful so far, I believe at a high risk, but the numbers are still um, successful. And then there's questions, and again, this is most of the scientific community, that improvement in tracing could be much more, even given the limitations we have learned of the Chilean state. Lessons then for the short run for how to handle with the pandemic, avoid excess confidence bias, um, be aware of what you know and what you don't know when you design your strategies, do not politicize policies, 
it's when you handle the pandemic, it's to your advantage. This is highly risky. We really don't know what's going to happen. The most likely outcome is that you have problems, share, share the cost of those failures with broader, with opposition parties, with majors, with the scientific community, delegate as much as possible, be transparent with your data. Um, um, there's an, an, an survey came, which came out today. I was not able to get the slide to include it here, but it's in the newspaper today in the morning um, from Ipsos, um, evaluating the Chilean government's handling of the pandemic. And the worst score in general, it's not that great, but the worst score by far is about uh, the numbers on deaths and, um, and cases. People just don't trust it, okay? And to no avail. In the end, people find out the numbers anyway. There's just confusion and mistrust involved. Um, and if you want to pro promote economic activity, you need to control the pandemic. This supposed um, trade-off, of course, if we take to the extreme, there are trade-offs, but not the way governments perceive it. You need to control the pandemic to have economic recovery. And um, often governments, I think, get that's wrong as well. Thinking about the long run, Chile will need to review its, uh, revise its health system. Um, there was well-known health management problems in the system, which became extremely apparent. Uh, there's a lack of coordination. The system was municipalized to a big extent in all that's preventive medicine like 15 years ago. When you had to coordinate, which you need for tracing, it just has been extremely difficult. Um, the institutions with which we manage data in Chile, you also want to reform. Um, the numbers on people dying should not be part of the political debate. Um, the political debate should be about what we do about preventing more people from dying, but not the actual numbers. And, and unfortunately, it was a central part of the debate. And finally, and that's what Chile is beginning this Sunday with a plebiscite, um, is um, Chile needs a new social contract. The, um, social outbreak of late October led to a political agreement, which was pretty broad in mid-November of having a process which begins this Sunday and will hopefully end within a year, year and a half in a new constitution. The pandemic has made apparent a number of issues which will um, inform and hopefully be dealt with in this constitutional process. Thank you very much, Eduardo. Um, and thanks you both for, for, for cogent uh, descriptions of the experiences of, of Chile and Peru that are both um, honest about the dimensions of the crisis, honest about uh, some of the mistakes made initially, the dimensions of the economic challenges, uh, and, uh, and the tough road ahead. Um, before we open up uh, things more widely to Q&A, and I encourage folks in the audience to continue to submit questions to, to, to the Q&A box, um, which I'll be um, aggregating and, and, and asking of our panelists in just a moment. I'd like to throw a question out uh, to the two of you. Uh, and this has to do with um, you know, the, uh, the reaction, the, uh, what should be the priorities of governments given uh, a likely wave two? Um, in Europe, we've seen a sharp rebound in cases. Um, some of this may be weather related, uh, but some of it also has to do with, with just with COVID fatigue and people's uh, behavioral adjustments beginning to break down. Uh, in the United States, we've already had wave two and we look like we're on uh, uh, to wave three. So in each of your presentations, you highlighted the lesson learned and the manner in which governments were incorporating data in new um, and, and hopefully more effective ways. Um, I would anticipate that that COVID fatigue is gonna be an issue in the region as well. And it's not just a behavioral thing. It's also an economic thing as people run down savings and they, they start to run out of opportunities to, um, to adjust on their own. So if you had to think about the one or two central things that uh, your respective country needs to do uh, to stave off a potential wave two, um, what would that be? Um, and what's interesting about the two contexts is that these are fluid politics. Uh, uh, elections coming in Peru, a plebiscite in Chile, there's, um, there's, uh, it's a moment of, of heightened uh, political uh, intensity. So perhaps, Minister Alba, we could, we could begin with your answer to that question, and then Eduardo will turn to you. Um, thank you. Uh, you know, we have been, uh, and when we took this decision of this very uh, strong lockdown, we were very conscious about the economic consequences. When we see uh, the numbers of GDP of April or May, it's because of we have uh, really, really locked down the economy, even, the, even 
the mining activity that is around 10 uh, points of, of our GDP. Um, we, we also locked down those activity because we were uh, different from, from Chile, I think. Uh, our, um, our system was very weak, our health system. And as, an, and as I, I show in some slides, for uh, 32 million of Peruvians, we had less than 300 uh, UCI beds. So we are really, really in a very complicated situation. So we first, uh, and, and for me, it was clear that the best economic plan for the country was to control the pandemic. That, that for me is the is the best economic plan we, we should implement it. So at that time, uh, this uh, very severe lockdown was the best uh, plan we we could uh, design. And we initially designed this plan in four phases. And each phase has been monitored in order to like, it's very important here that um, the Ministry of Economics and the Ministry of Health really, really talk every day. So we, we have a very uh, dynamic uh, uh, interaction with the Minister of Health. So what happened now when we think about the second wave? We had to our plans of phase number four uh, that was supposed to be by the end of August. We have to think about a more gradual fourth phase. So we had to change our initial plans. We are monitoring right now how is the pandemic um, um, doing in, in these days. So the first, um, the first uh, decision we had to take in order when we see the second wave is to be our reopening of the economy is slower than we initially planned. The second thing is here in Latin America, you know that Lima is the only uh, capital city in Latin America that has a beach. So we are, we are entering summer. So um, during, the, during the crisis, the health uh, teams identified these, uh, where, where they call that these infection focuses that were uh, markets, uh, public transportation, and then we consider, like the experts consider that the, that the next uh, focus for infections will be beaches. So now that the teams are preparing, it, it's going to be very complicated. You know, um, here in Peru, this probably happened in, in other countries. Um, people start to think about or that consider that these very uh, strong uh, lockdowns are almost uh, are very controversial for for human for liberties. So now uh, here, in, in, at least in all the coast of Peru, summer is really important for people. So now we are uh, at least the, the health uh, minister is designing this strategy of how we are going to to deal with with summer and with lots of people uh, going to the beach. So so the first ans answer is um, to be more gradual in our reopening of economy. The second is. Uh, to identify this focus of infection, like uh, markets, beaches, and, and develop the special special strategies for that, and of course um, data, no uh, tracing the the spread of the virus. That, that is very very important for us. We uh, right now are developing. Uh, I don't know how to say this in English. Um, this is how uh, do zero prevalence. Zero prevalence. You do these studies, and in each city you see what is the level of of um, contagion of, of how like the, the spread of the uh, of the pandemic in in each city we are uh, tracing data at, at the end uh, by city and we are going to uh, develop our reopening of economy strategy considering these these numbers in spanish is studies of cero prevalencia i don't know how to translate that in english but it's like monitoring how the the, the virus has already been spread in some cities in Peru, they say that 70% of the population has already been infected. Like uh, we had uh, some crisis in, in the jungle in Iquitos, that is part of Loreto region. And they say in some study that 70% of the population got infected. So we are trying to uh, get these numbers for each important city in order to identify uh, whether or not we are going to reopen or be more um, strict in opening on, or in closing the economy. Great, thank you very much. Eduardo. I think we need you to unmute, Eduardo.
I think we need you to unmute one more time. There Is we go. Now? Yeah. Yes. Great. On the on the positive side, I believe that Chile and other countries have a number of months where they can do many things before the next winter comes. So um, people are now the weather's improving, summer's on its way, people are outdoors um, much more than before. So I think containing the virus will be easier than it was during the winter. Um, and people are also much more aware of, of taking care of themselves. And it's not perfect, but it has improved significantly. Um, so I think that provides an opportunity to put in place a number of health measures. Um, a lot needs to be done to improve tracing. It is still quite poor and I think it's the best um, insurance against avoiding again very strict lockdowns. So the question is not whether you will have an increase in cases. I think you will have it with a high probability. The question is whether you will be able to detect this fast and control it and tracing is crucial there and much more can be done. And we have a number of months where that can be put in place and hopefully will. The second is to change the discourse, the political discourse. Um, you need, there's a big debate now in Chile about returning to schools and just no one wants to bring their kids to school and the government has been very aggressive with it in terms of wanting to force students to restart and the union of teachers has been very aggressive in terms of not wanting to do anything about it. And you need something in between where you have parents, teachers sit down at every specific school and just discuss what you're gonna to do to do this. Um, so most likely not much will happen this school year, which ends in November, December. But again, we have time to March of next year to reach agreements in every school community and start going back to school then. So I think a change of political discourse is, is crucial in terms of the economic. Um, the economy has bottomed out in Chile. Numbers are somewhat better. And I would say the major threat these days is not handling correctly or not avoiding or having a major second wave. I think that threat is at this moment the major threat in Chile. Numbers for this year will be bad, but less bad than expected. IMF numbers suggest GDP will fall by a bit less than 6%, which given the numbers we have on the health side is it's not as terrible as thing people thought a couple of months ago it would be. Um, but changing the political dynamics um, developing a good tracing system, I think are two um, central elements which should make less likely that we have a second wave that gets out of control. Great, uh, thank you for that. And thanks to you both for your answer to that question uh, regarding uh, priorities for what the government can do as, it, uh, as countries possibly confront a second wave. Uh, there are a number of questions about that relate to government spending and how to make it as effective as possible. On the one hand, uh, we had a couple of questions regarding what can be done to make um, shoring up the safety net in, in countries uh, as uh, uh, targeting individuals who are gonna be facing utmost need with Peru and Chile facing very different contexts. So how do you spend money in a way that deals with a, a safety net that may have, have holes in it? Relatedly, the government, as we, as we move further into the pandemic and as we look forward to the possibility of a vaccine and so forth, um, expanded government procurement and the possibilities of corruption uh, will grow only more abundant. So can you, can you also comment about what governments can do in a very challenging situation where you need to spend money very quickly to avoid um, opportunities for corruption? We'll go in reverse order uh, this time and Eduardo begin with you. I, I think that targeting expenditures is very, very important. I think one of the things that Chile did well early, in fact, one of the policy reforms under the military dictatorship, which was important, um, was in targeting social expenditures. But I think for the pandemic, you should not um, you should not give it too much importance. I think it's much more important to get the money there and not to try to target. And the Chilean example being one of the countries which targets best social expenditures in Latin America, when, when the moment came, we did a poor job. 500,000 people got the money they were not entitled to. And it was not that easy to target in these difficult times because you must target migrants and you must target people outside of the system and the like. And in the process, it just did not work that well. So I would say that countries with the ability to go into debt like Chile and Peru, which were the two countries with most fiscal space before the pandemic, I would not give it that much uh, importance. I mean, 
you must give it eventually, but in, in these months, the trade-off I think just tells you, it's, you the saving lives is much more important, even if you think about the, only about the economy. Okay, so I think that's not the, regarding public procurement, um, that is an issue, definitely. And to the extent you can keep in place the situation, I mean, you're not going to do things better than you did before the pandemic. It's a success story if you do things as well as you've been doing before it because you need to spend fast. And um, often you have not the time to call for a procurement auction as you would usually do. Often there are not that many companies who will show up. So try to keep in place all the safeguards you have to avoid collusion, to avoid corruption, um, but major reforms of your public procurement system will have to wait till after the pandemic. Now, on a positive side, there's gonna be a major opportunity for that type of reforms all over Latin America. Usually these state reforms are very unpopular politically because the government which leaves them will have only cost at the upfront and then the benefits are long run usually for future administrations. But you will ha have um, fiscal problems, you will have big levels of debt. So politically ministers of finance or the economy as, as Mr. Alba will have strong incentives to push these reforms through Congress even if they are unpopular, not now, but in 2021, 2022. So I think on the positive side, you will have a very, um, as in, the, the sort of scenario you seldom we have where you can really push through reforms of the state, including uh, public procurement reform. In the case of Chile, the government has already announced a public procurement reform. There's been projects um, prepared for a number of years in the past, but none of them had been sort of entered Congress. And I believe that next year, there's going to be one of the projects which might pass Congress precisely because it's going to be important for government finances. Thank you very much, Eduardo. And Minister Alva, uh, turning to you, the two questions being, uh, on the one hand, how does Peru help address uh, challenges that, that it has in, in shoring up its social safety net in a country where levels of informality are very high and there's a premium on getting money into people's pockets as quickly as, as possible, as Eduardo highlighted. Uh, and then second, um, how do we handle government procurement in a way that minimizes opportunity for corruption, which can undermine public confidence in, in government efforts to, to handle the pandemic? Hey, thank you. Yes, as, as you know, 70% uh, of our labor force is informal. So we have these structural problems in, in this uh, delivering of the subsidies to the families. In different from Chile, we don't have this uh, every citizen doesn't have a bank account. Uh, so we are already uh, implementing that and since November of, implementing that and since November of this year, El Banco de la Nación will uh, have all the capacity to generate with your ID, a bank account. So it's also important to, to say that uh, this crisis has also given us opportunities to, to tackle some structural problems as is a uh, financial inclusion. So uh, our, main objective with public spending at the, at, the, at the beginning of the crisis was to, to get the money to families. So we implemented this huge uh, subsidy program. It's, a, it's the biggest in the, in the Peruvian um, history. We also did some way of subsidies for elect, uh, electricity and, and water. That was another way that we uh, give uh, liquidity to families, not only through the subsidy, but also uh, we are paying their their bills of electricity and we are getting water to um, especially urban areas where they don't have all the uh, sanitation and, and, the, and the water. And we are also a uh, temporary increase in the, the, the population of some of our cash uh, transfer pro, uh, programs we have here uh, juntos, uh, for instance, so for, for these uh, following months, we are uh, including the, the number of beneficiaries of these uh, cash uh, social programs. And then uh, once we use this money to try to contain the, this uh, liquidity problem that, were, that families were getting, then we designed a program that is called Arranca Peru. It's almost one point of the GDP. This is a, a not necessary investment project, but some activities such as a cleaning, a, for instance, a cleaning the streets or fixing some things in the infrastructure. So we uh, created that in order to 
uh, improve the quality of some infrastructure, but also this is like a temporary um, work uh, labor program. We try to create 1 million jobs there. This will, this will help um, families to get some income in this, in this very uh, easy way to, to spend money. We also, and that is something that Eduardo mentioned, usually during the crisis, uh, governments design this fiscal stimulus, but nobody uh, really uh, executed those, those budgets. So when we design all the interventions related to fiscal stimulus from the government, we also we only not, not only think about giving budget, but we also generate special procurement processes so that spending will be uh, faster. And also, uh, and this was something related to uh, the quality of expenditure. We were we have been working uh, several months ago in a new um, law for procurement process. That law is already uh, in consultation with all the agents, but that will be uh, very important for next year. Not not only uh, for corruption, but also but for the efficiency of the public spending. What we have identified um, is that. Uh, especially I think that one of the most important things of, of the whole procurement process is that you need to create like a body of very well uh, trained public service, public servants, like an, a special body of public servants uh, related to procurement process. And then uh, you have to pay them good salaries. You have people uh, with really low salaries uh, managing uh, millions of of dollars for, for, for infrastructure. So I think that part of the reform that we are proposing will be human capital and how we build a specialized uh, team of public servants related to all procurement process. That, that is something very important for us as part of the reform that we are proposing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, our time is winding down. And so this will be the last set of questions I'll present uh, to the panel. There are a number of questions about uh, assessing the macroeconomic situation and the role of international financial institutions in, in helping countries uh, adjust. On the one hand, when we look at predictions about what's going to be happening in, in different countries, things have, uh, have changed dramatically from initial very dire predictions, now things looking perhaps a little bit less dire. Um, is there a concern that governments might feel a little bit less pressure because of changing expectations about the severity of the downturn. So that's one part uh, of the question. Uh, the other part of the question has to do with um, the extraordinary efforts that entities like the International Monetary Fund have taken in helping countries. Um, and instead of preaching austerity, which the IMS has done for generations, it's, uh, they've gone out and are in effect creating money, um, which they've never done. Uh, has, do you feel that the IMF um, has been uh, helpful in the approach it's taken to offer liquidity countries, or is this really the primary efforts have really been the countries themselves uh, taking on the challenge? Minister Alba, we'll start with you. And um, thank you. Uh, regarding these uh, uh, growth expectations uh, and and all these fiscal expectations that we have, uh, I think that uh, since we um, took this very aggressive lockdown. We were very uh, transparent, I think, regarding how this will impact the economy. Uh, in fact, uh, all the projections, all, all that, like our projections at the Ministry of Finance were really uh, very well calibrated. In August, we had a, a surprise because uh, we expected, uh, I think that's a uh, minus 10 and at, at the end was minus nine. So it's, we were very, uh, happy with that because we are in one uh, digit uh, of this of this number. Uh, but what was really important for us is to be very prudent uh, regarding the formulation of the budget for next year. This will be a budget that will um, the, the the new president, the new team will come uh, in the 28th of July of next year. So we were very prudent about our uh, project, our forecasts regarding growth. Regard, regarding um, a tax uh, contributions. So uh, the budget for next year is a budget uh, that was formulated during a crisis. And because you're still in a crisis, 
you need some uh, public spending for the crisis. You need uh, money for the health system and money for continue with the fiscal stimulus of these temporary um, programs that create uh, jobs. So if you see um, the budget for next year without this temporary spending for the health crisis and the economic crisis, the budget, um, if you don't, don't consider that, is like a, a, a budget with austerity, you know, we have. And the other thing that is, I think, a good thing in, in the Peruvian case is that we have a very rigid um, fiscal rules and every year that you have an election, you cannot increase salaries or increase, increase pension. So the budget for next year have a, those a controls regarding a, generating more, more spending for next government. I, I think a, that the, the, new, the new team and we as a team of minister of, of, uh, here will, will prepare some documents and some proposals for the next uh, government. And, and regarding the IMF, usually in Peru, the, the, the IMF works with the central bank as part of the monetary policy, not fiscal policy. I, I know that um, they have been very helpful for the central bank. And in, in terms of the Minister of Finance, I had a, a meeting with them last week. Uh, we are going to be very serious about the new consolidation uh, phase uh, that the government, the Peruvian government will need to, to take. So we are uh, getting their technical assistance to all the, the part related to taxes and the part related to improving the quality of public expenditure. So uh, their technical teams usually are very helpful for us, but uh, Informality is a central bank who works with them here in Peru. Thank you very much, Minister Alva. Uh, Eduardo, we'll turn to you again with a two-part question. Uh, one regarding, um, are there concerns about the manner in which uh, governments are interpreting changes in, in macroeconomic forecasts, uh, which might lead them to, to back off a bit in terms of the intensity of their efforts? And from Chile's perspective, have international financial institutions played an important role in, in supporting the response to the pandemic? Well, the second question is to a big extent that the role of the IMF and other international financial institutions in the case of Chile has been relatively small. Um, Chile has had access to, to debt abroad and has not needed significant help from IFIs. Um, regarding the first question, which is very interesting in fact, well, I believe even though GDP numbers are looking somewhat better, um, what people really care about and what is most relevant politically is employment and the return to employment. And these are the sort of situations where you must look at employment numbers and not unemployment because people get out of the labor force, right? so that doesn't help much. Um, you want them back in again. Um, that's going to take longer anyway. So the numbers are more optimistic. Things have bottomed out in a number of countries in the region. If you look at GDP, but the forecast for employment is that you will have a recovery, which will take easily a year, maybe two years as well, till you get back to full employment. It's going to be a slow process. As we know, employment recuperates later than it numbers on production start to improve. Uh, hopefully this will be a bit faster than the other recessions as Minister Alba suggested um, will be the case in Peru. Um, so I think that there's going to be enough challenges and I think governments are, um, are not misreading that part. Uh, they're, they're truly aware that the challenges in terms of employment are, are very, very high. Well you, well, you could have helped, I don't know if it's IMF, but maybe the World Bank or other multilaterals, is in contributing to a more nuanced discussion of, of policies. Not only the economic part where, where they help a lot, but also on the health side, where the World, World Health Organization sometimes isn't that useful. Um, for example, in many countries in Latin America, you have demonized, either you have a total lockdown, the quarantenas, or you have nothing at all, and you don't have a more nuanced discussion about which measures are effective, which ones are not, and looking for middle grounds which are reasonable. And coming back to a previous question you asked, Gordon, about people being tired about all their measures and restrictions, well, that requires a more nuanced discussion. It's not black or white. In Chile, at the worst moments, 
in poor neighborhoods, mobility went down only 10 to 20%, despite the fact that in fear you had a total quarantine. And that was partly that the economic help was not there, partly that people live in conditions which make it harder to go through quarantine, but also partly that there was no social conversation or dialogue about that we're all in this together and each one within his limitations can help a lot others as well. So I think that the, we have months to prepare to have um, a much better state of, of people's attitude toward what's coming um, when we um, face next year, which unfortunately the vaccine might still not be there by May or April, at least in Latin America. Thank you very much. And thank, thanks to you both uh, for this very uh, frank and illuminating discussion. I think a lot of times when we you know, look at the press, the news that we get in the US, the news you get in Europe on what's uh, coming out of Latin America is just unremittingly dire. And I think both of your presentations have been honest about the severity of the challenges that the region uh, faces, but also have shown important ways in which countries have learned from their mistakes, um, are trying to, to apply that learning in, in real time and are looking hard at the choices that are gonna to have to be made in the coming months since, uh, since this pandemic does not appear to be going away uh, anytime soon. So uh, thanks to you both, uh, Minister Maria Antonieta Alva, uh, Professor Eduardo Engel, um, you're on the front lines of this, uh, you're doing important work for your countries and we're just, uh, we're delighted that you were willing to spend some time with us today so that we could learn uh, from your experiences and gain insights um, into the ongoing impacts of COVID-19 on Latin America. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.